Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 5, Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 15, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. These are the readings for Wednesday and the Ember week of Advent, which is also uh, the, the readings for the Rorate Mass, um, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, so these are particular to the Advent season. And um, the, the focus really for this Lexio, even though you can read the other readings and that would be helpful, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on Isaiah 7, 10 through 15, and just go into one verse there. And um, I'm going to be talking about the new declaration that was, uh, this is Wednesday, um, Ember, Ember Wednesday during Advent and third week of Advent. And on Monday of this week, the third week in Advent, um, a de declaration was uh, declared by the Vatican um, regarding the blessing of those that are in civil unions, but not married in the church. Um, and also as well as uh, so-called same-sex uh, couples, so, same-sex unions, but also same-sex couples. Um, and it's called fiducia, I hope I'm saying this right, fiducio supplicans, fiducia supplicans. So I want to go ahead and uh, just share a little bit of my thoughts on this regarding really how it ties into one of the readings. Um, the reason I'm doing this is very simple. I, this channel is not a political commentary on church news, although those things are important to me. Um, I do work for the church and uh, three people, three parishioners have asked me, what are my thoughts on this document? And so I did spend the time on Monday. I spent almost an hour and a half, almost two hours, going through the document and reading it carefully. I would recommend if this is of interest to you, and even if you're watching this video because you're like interested in, in what people's commentary or take on this is, um, then, and it has been all over the news, uh, at least the last two days, uh, Monday and Tuesday for sure, um, pretty much everywhere. And so if you are interested in this topic and you are wondering, first and foremost, go ahead and just read the entire document. Spend an hour, no distractions, print it out, get it online, just put in fiducia supplicans uh, into the, the Google or whatever you use and it'll come up Vatican site in English or whatever language, and then um, and then do some uh, control finds, just some interesting things that you might do. So that's what I did. I really recommend doing that. And then after doing that, th then you can listen to all the commentaries, uh, which, which here for me, this is really a reflection. So why am I doing this? Well, one, three people have asked me what my take is on it. And I feel like a simple text or a short conversation by phone doesn't really do it justice. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time here um, after I've had time to pray about it and think about it to put some of my thoughts down. These are not my exhaustive thoughts, but just some immediate things, especially based on the readings. What I try to do with this channel and with Lexio and Divina and my own daily reading, which in this channel I've been doing this for about four or five years now, is what is going on in the world? What is going on in the church? What's going on in my own life? And how does that have to do with the scripture that's given to me at that time by the church? So the church has a liturgical year gives us these wonderful scriptures, and then we, we uh, make sense of it out of our life. And so I've shared a lot over these last, I think this is uh, the, the, the 335th episode. So over these last 300 episodes, I've shared a lot. Uh, part of this was during COVID, all this kind of stuff. So um, all I'm really doing here is just sharing uh, kind of what's on my mind, but based on the scripture that was given to us uh, for today, and I, I hope it's edifying. It's not exhaustive, but it's, it's my takeaway based on the scripture today. Um, I do want to, since there's a lot going on in my, in my mind right now, I do want to pray the prayer, student prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, so that I can be clear, charitable um, with what I am about to share. So the student prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, Graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, an obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations, and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So first off, 
want to go ahead and read the, the scripture from Isaiah. This is a prophecy, um, and this prophecy is uh, particularly um, regarding the church, the Catholic church. In those last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be prepared on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So important. Let me read it again. In those last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be prepared on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. So I'm going to make some distinctions here because I think the document makes some distinctions. The first distinction is, in my opinion, sections 1 through 11 are really talking almost sometimes in a very beautiful way, very clear way, about the mountaintop, about what the church says marriage is. All right. So if you're reading sections, paragraphs 1 through 11 of this document, you're going to be on, you're going to be like, right on, man. This is perfect. This is always what the church has taught. No problems here. And then I remember as I was reading it very distinctly, as soon as I got to paragraph 12, I, it was as, as if the train went off the rail at that point. Paragraph 12 is the departure. And so the distinction is made at that point. You have very clear distinction in this document between paragraphs 1 through 11, which is really the mountaintop, and then sections 12 through 45, which of course is the majority, which would be the hills. And if you see the illustration here, you can see I have the mountains and then I have the hills. So let's make a distinction, a few distinctions here. One is paragraphs 1 through 11 are very, very, very different from paragraphs 12 through 45. The hills are very different than the mountains. The mountains are different from the hills. The church is on the top of the mountains, right? The house of the Lord shall be prepared on the top of the mountains, the highest of the high, right? And it's exalted above the hills, all right? And all nations shall flow unto it. Where? Where shall all nations flow to? All nations will flow up to the top, right? The mountains are greater than the hills. The nations, the Gentiles, the people, the 8 billion people on the face of the earth should flow up to the top. What do you know about things that flow up? Well, that's difficult. That's hard. So there is a distinction here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and further distinctions. Very clearly in the first sections, and I, I want to make the distinction between the, um, in a sense, varsity and JV. If you understand that analogy, if you were in public schools growing up, then you know there's the freshman team, there's the JV team, and there's the varsity team. And of course, everyone wants to be on the varsity team because the varsity team gets all the money, gets all the attention, gets all the good players, it gets the, the picture in the paper and all that kind of stuff. So I really do feel like there's a distinction here being made for people to either be at the varsity level or at the JV level. If you want to put that into theological terms, you have the reception of a sacrament, the reception of the sacrament, which we understand to be habitual grace, also called sanctifying grace. Habitual because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are dwelling in your soul. And every time you receive a sacrament, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are already in your soul by a sacrament, are increasing in sanctifying grace. In other words, habitual, staying, permanent, right? And so the reception of the sacrament is the mountaintop. The mass and the sacraments are the mountaintop. They are what the church offers for the salvation of souls. How can we be sure that we are in the state of grace? Are you receiving the sacraments? So if you're listening to this and you are not baptized, work on getting baptized. We know St. Paul, St. Peter says very clearly, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. That's the, that's the flow. Jesus says, uh, first words, I think of either Mark or Matthew's gospel, but in the gospel, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So there's always this um, repenting, but the goal is always, because Jesus set it up this way, he set up a church to sanctify us. The church sanctifies us through the sacraments so that we can be sure that Jesus is abiding in us and that we have sanctifying grace and we are going to heaven, right? Um, it's, it's, it's the best chance we have, of course, is to have sanctifying grace. Well, how do I know I'm in sanctifying grace? I mean, you can ask three questions. How do I know I'm in sanctifying grace? Have you been baptized? Okay. Have you committed a mortal sin after baptism or after your last confession? So you could ask this. 
um, for, I'm assuming this is for an adult Catholic going to confession. This would be the, the thing. If you're going to confession regularly, you're an, adult, you're an adult Catholic going to confession regularly, you'd ask this question. How do I know if I'm in, this, in sanctifying grace? How do I know if I'm in the state of grace? Uh, best chance, of course, to go to heaven. Well, one, um, are you baptized? Yes. At your, less, at your last confession, did you, um, if you had mortal sin, did you confess all your mortal sins? All your mortal sins. Yes, I did. Since that last confession, have you committed another mortal sin? So if you say, if I asked you, are you baptized? Yes, I am, Matt. Um, at your last confession, if you had mortal sin, did you confess all your mortal sins? Yes, I did. And since that last confession, have you committed a mortal sin? No, I haven't. Okay, if those, if those are your answers, then you have every reason to believe you are in sanctifying grace, Father, Son, Holy Spirit dwelling in your soul. And so love God and do what you will, right? This is great. This is wonderful. Okay. So the reception of the sacraments is our highest standard. It is the mountaintop. It is awesome. And then this document says there are some moral conditions, however. There are moral conditions to receive the sacraments. For example, to receive any sacrament, you have to be baptized. To be baptized, there are moral conditions. In order to be baptized, you can't be willingly persisting in a serious sin. And that really is the moral condition. You can't enter into a sacrament if you are willingly persisting in a serious sin. What's a serious sin? Well, those are given to us by God. Those are given to us by Jesus Christ in the gospel. Those are given to us by the epistles of St. Paul and, and on and the, and the church, you know, Peter and, and all of them. And it's given to us by the church. And so, the moral condition for the reception of a sacrament is that we are not willingly persisting in serious sin. In the area of sexual sins, this can be very simple. So you can ask yourself, well, I don't know if I'm committing a sexual sin. I don't know if I'm willingly persisting in a sexual sin. Well, you can ask these five questions and they're in the notes. Are you arousing yourself? sexually. Are you arousing yourself? Are you arousing another? Intentionally arousing yourself? Intentionally arousing another? Are you allowing another to intentionally arouse you? Is the sexual act within marriage, meaning a marriage divine by the church? And then is that marriage in the church? So again, let me say that because this is very, very, sexual sins seem to be the most predominant sin of our society right now. Um, maybe also not going to mass would be up there, but those two for sure. Commandments 3, 6, and 9. 3, 6, and 9 are, are rampant right now. Um, okay, so moral conditions in the area of sex. Um, you would not be able to make a good confession, for instance, which is a sacrament. You could not receive the sacrament of confession if you were willingly persisting in one of these five things. If you were arousing yourself, if you were arousing another, if you were allowing another to arouse you, if you were uh, having sex outside of marriage, and if your marriage was outside the church. So this is the heart of the matter because this is what we're talking about. This document, these 45 paragraphs are talking about those that are in a civil union, married outside the church, all right? And also those that a man and a man or a woman and a woman that are a couple. And, and it's assuming, we're assuming that this couple is doing romantic things, sexual things. And so this completely applies. And in this case, usually I stay out of things because they may not be necessarily my area, but this is my area. Why is this my area? I've been married for 23 years. All right. Now that's not a long, long time, but I am a married man. I'm a lay man. I'm a married man. I am married in the church. Um, I have a theology degree. Not that that matters too much, but I do have a theology degree. In other words, this is my craft. This is my trade. And I have worked for the church Next year in 2025, it will be January of 2025, it will be 30 years, 30 years that I've worked for the church in some capacity or another, the Catholic church, either in schools or parishes. So I, I kind of think if there was a plumber, for instance, that said, um, well, I went to trade school for four years. I have been, I've worked for four or five different companies. Now I own my own company. I've been doing plumbing for 30 years. I think I would trust that plumber. Again, if a plumber said, hey, and I said, what's your credibility? What, what are your credentials? And he said, well, I went to plumbing school for four years. And then after that, um, I've been working in the plumbing industry for 29 years. And I've worked a lot of different uh, companies and uh, seen a lot of different situations. So I do feel like I'm somewhat credible in this area. Again, I'm a layperson. I'm not clergy. But 
Um, this is an area that I, I have had a lot of experience in. So it looks like to receive a sacrament, for sure, it doesn't look like it is. To receive a sacrament, there are moral conditions. This document is saying that. Basically, the moral condition is repent and embrace the gospel. Repent and embrace the gospel. So that is what's necessary for a sacrament. That is the mountaintop. That is what we shoot for. That is what we should expect everyone to go towards. In other words, repent, embrace the gospel, and flow towards that mountaintop. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. If it means move out, separate, remain chaste until marriage. If it means that you're going to live as a single person and never get married, if you, if you have same-sex attraction, right? Whatever it takes to flow up that mountain. But remember, flowing up is hard. Going down is easy. Blowing up is hard. So this is hard, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, is it too difficult? Not with God's grace. Not with God's grace. So I do want to note that a, if you try to do a control F, if you do a, a search in this document, you will find repent. Now, I didn't check repentance, but the word repent is mentioned zero times. Zero times. No mention of repentance. Although in Scripture, Peter says this first. Repent and be baptized. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I believe, I don't know again what gospel, but I believe one of the first words of Jesus is repent. Okay. With that all being said, now let's actually go down to the hills. What, let's go down to the hill. Let's go down to the, the JV level. The almost like, um, I'm okay. I'm all right. Definitely settling for less. Much, much, much less. And this would be not the reception of a sacrament, but something totally different. The distinction here is, are you going to receive a sacrament or are you going to have a simple blessing? A pastoral gesture. And that's what the document says. Well, we want to give simple blessing, blessings, pastoral gestures. Now, pastoral gesture, who is doing the pastoral gesture? Well, this is for ordained ministers. So this document really is going to um, have to be dealt with by ordained ministers, holy orders, those in holy orders, which are the bishops, the priests, and the deacons. As a lay person, if someone comes up and asks for a blessing, it doesn't mean anything because I don't have the authority to bless. Someone says, achoo, oh, you know, sneezes, I can say, God bless you, you know, but we don't even allow extraordinary ministers, you know, of Holy Communion to, to do blessing. You know, in other words, the only people that can bless in the church in a formal way will be ordained ministers. So ordained ministers will be affected, of course, by this document in some way or another, as, as we see this play out, deacons, priests, and bishops, because they are the ones, the pastors are connected to the pastor that are then giving the gesture. So simple blessing, pastoral gesture, and it clearly says here, there should not be too many moral prerequisites. So in other words, to get a sacrament, to receive a sacrament in the Catholic Church, there are moral conditions. Repentance. Embrace the gospel. To get a simple blessing, a pastoral gesture, there are not too many moral prerequisites. And you could even say maybe there are no uh, prerequisites at all morally. So what does this mean? Well, it just means basically you want a blessing, you get a blessing. What does that blessing mean? Well, it means whatever you think it means. Um, but it's definitely not a sacrament, right? It's definitely not the mountain. Uh, just to be clear, you're not playing on varsity team. You're on the JV. You're not on the mountaintop. You're on the hills, right? And what, what kind of bothers me about this is, are we okay with that? Are we okay with people just staying at the hill level? And there's, I mean, maybe people can interpret into this document that, yes, the church is wanting us to move from the hill to the mountain, but it's not really specifically said there. At least I'm not interpreting it that way. I don't see anything about repentance. In fact, I did a, a little search on sin. You know, and how many times is sin mentioned? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. But it, so sin is mentioned in this document, either sin or sinners, but it's not really it's not so much calling people out of their sin specifically. You could interpret it that way, but I don't, I don't really think it is, is calling people out of sin in a, in a specific way. It's more saying that God will come to us 
when we are in our sin. So St. Paul says that while we were still sinning, but the implication there is that while we were sinning, he came to us to call us out of the sin. He came from the mountains to the hill to bring us up the mountain. And I'm not really hearing that in this document. I hope people interpret that into it, but I'm not, I'm not really hearing that or seeing that. Uh, maybe it'll be applied that way. I don't know. But it also could be applied the other way. Just stay where you're at and you're fine. It's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Everyone's okay. Um, there was another part here. It said, you know, while we were clouded by sin or even in the midst of our sins, um, people that humble, humbly acknowledge themselves as sinners. And that's another question here. Those that are on the hill, do they even acknowledge themselves as sinners? In other words, if two people are coming for a blessing, a man and a man are coming for a blessing, but there is no intention, no intention at all of getting out of their sin, sexual sin in this case, or a mockery of marriage, then then are they really seeing themselves as sinners at all? You know, and, and that's what this, this, this document implies that they should see themselves as sinners, but are they going to? Are they going to do that? So that's why I think really we should call the person out of the sin, repent, embrace the gospel, flow up the mountain. What happens if we don't, in other words, I guess you could even think of deacons, priests, and bishops particularly, when they're going to the people in these situations, right, in these sins, in these situations, in the condition of, they, they are representants, to, um, the priest, the deacon, and the bishop are on the mountaintop. They are the authority that is coming from the top of the mountain. They are coming down the mountain as Christ descended in the incarnation to the sinner. But what should they do? Well, like Christ, they elevate the sinner up and have them come up to the mountain. What does that mean? Repentance, gospel, embrace the gospel, receive the sacrament. So that's the flow up the mountain. And so they come down, obviously, to help people come up. But they don't stay down on the hill. They bring people up. So there's a danger here of instead of a call for those on the hill to come up to the top, there's a danger that everyone on top could sink down to the hill and that we are all pulled from varsity down to JV rather than going from the JV team up to the varsity team, going from I'm okay, you're okay to it's, it's difficult, but I want holiness. I want holiness. So I want to just point out two other things too here on my on, on kind of my take on this. And one is, and this came out very clearly, that there's this mention of what does the blessing mean? What does the blessing mean? And in one section, I don't remember the particular part here, but one section said, well, we're blessing. What are we blessing? We're blessing what is true and good and humanly valid. So if there are two people that are obviously in a, a sinful situation, the, the church needs to, again, call them to repent out of that, embrace the gospel, and then receive a sacrament. Not to, dis, not to just get a simple blessing, to move up the mountain, flow up the mountain. But instead, in this case, this could be, I think, interpreted, and, and I'm kind of seeing it this way, that, oh, well, we're just blessing what is true, good, and humanly valid. Well, what does humanly valid mean? And in this case, what does true and good mean? Is it relative? Is it humanistic in a sense? Um, now, it, the document says live better or better life four times. That what this couple is asking for is to just have a better life, to live better. Well, that's not good enough. That's definitely not good enough. Just having a better life or living better is not really the Christian way. The Christian way is to be holy. So I don't want just a better life. I want a holy life and I want heaven and I want to do whatever it takes to get to heaven and living in sin does not get me to heaven. Instead, unrepented and willingly persisting in it, it would get me to hell. So we want to call people out of that, of course, repent, embrace the gospel, flow up the mountain, receive the sacraments, live in the sacraments, live in the state of grace, habitual grace. The other thing that, that really kind of jumps out to me is, is the section where it says, whenever you do these blessings, they can't, the blessing can't have any clothing, gestures, or words that are proper to a wedding. Now, what do we mean by wedding here? We mean a sacrament. So basically, think of it this way. 
the simple blessing pastoral gesture that is being given cannot it can't right it's not saying should here it's saying it can't the simple blessing pastoral gesture can't have any clothing gestures words proper to a sacrament that straight off the bat sounds like protestant to me okay so we're going to go ahead and do the lord's supper we're going to do the lord's supper but we're not going to make it look anything like the catholic church in other words we're not going to have um, someone that looks like a priest we're not going to have vestments uh, we're not going to have a high altar we'll, we'll have something else but we won't have a high altar um, and we won't use any of the words uh, that's used in the Catholic Mass. So you can see that this was happening 400 years ago. When there was this simple blessing, the Lord's Supper, this pastoral gesture. And, and what happened is, anytime we're going to do something other than a sacrament, and we don't want it to look like a sacrament, it basically, at, at its heart, is Protestant. And so... If we just want a better life, then we're, we're basically humanist, secular humanist. If I just want a better life, I don't really want holiness. I just want a better life, right? Well, then we're, we're kind of humanist, naturalist. We're indifferent. If we just are asking God to bless what is true, good, and human value in my life, then we're really pagans there. We're just asking the gods, hey, bless me. Just don't curse me. So this is very naturalist, humanist, pagan, and Protestant. And that's my take on it. Um, so what does this look like? What does this really look like? If it can't have any clothing, gestures, or words proper to a wedding or proper to a sacrament, because it's not a sacrament, and the church wanted to be clear about that, what does this look like? Well, I'm just going to use the example myself. Let's say I'm a priest. I'm Father Gill, all right? I'm Matt Gill, Father Gill. If Father Gill is going to marry me and say, and Father Gill is going to be at an altar, in a church, at an altar, with beautiful vestments on, and he's going to use the words of the church. All right, so that's what a sacrament would look like. Well, what if two men come to Father Gill, or they call him up, or they knock on the rectory door, and they say, we heard this new document is out. We would like to have you give us a simple blessing, a pastoral gesture. And I say, okay, well, here's the deal. I can't have any clothes like a priest. So I'm going to go ahead and wear my flannel uh, t-shirt and blue jeans and cowboy boots because I can't have any clothing. I can't do any gestures uh, like I can't do something like this or outstretch my arms or things like that. I can't do any gestures. So it's going to be pretty simple. Um, and, and I don't want it to be in the church by the altar because that could be confusing. Um, and I'm not going to be able to use any words like uh, that would be in the marriage rite. So why don't you meet me uh, this Saturday at the park? Uh, I'll be just kind of around that picnic bench area. You know, just look for me. Um, I'm not going to just don't call me Father Gill, please. Just call me Matt. Uh, so instead, just meet Matt at the park. He'll be wearing flannel shirt and, and jeans and the cowboy boots and um and then he'll say a, a few nice words that spontaneously come to him. Uh, and, and please don't don't make a big deal out of it either. Either And, you know, yeah, you can have some pictures taken. That's fine. But just kind of keep it down low, right? Okay. Very, very different, right? Again, a distinction is made. You can see the difference between JV and varsity, between the hill and the mountaintop. Are those two people really going to want that? Are those two people really going to want Matt with his flannel and his blue jeans and his cowboy boots and a picnic? downplayed no they're not they're not they're gonna want the beautiful church with the altar with the vestments with the music with father and they want pictures and things like that so again this this desire to the, the, uh, people want to flow up the mountain they really do but flowing up the mountain is difficult so in a sense what is it you, you can't have your cake and eat it too or whatever um but uh, you know, there's just a lot here. Those are my major points. Um, and, and and again, I just can't say enough about just reading the document um, prayerfully. Um, I do want to say that the, the footnotes don't help you a, a lot. Um, basically, Pope Francis is quoting himself because 64% of the end notes, the references, 64% of the references are all coming from Pope Francis 
which means that all of the references for this document, this declaration, it really only is referring to the last 10 years of the Catholic Church. So it's a declaration based off primarily 64% of just the last 10 years, not accounting for the 2000 year beautiful tradition of our church. Um, so uh, with all of that, I could go on and on, but we're already at half an hour. So um, thank you for watching. Let's pray, let's be bold. Let's flow up the mountain. Let's be holy. Let's play on the varsity team. And, um, and, and let's just completely in our own lives repent from sin, embrace the gospel, and live a holy life. That's what we need to do. Um, a lot of people have said, well, what do I do about this? What do I do about this? And um, yesterday I put out a little video called Catholic Cube. And I did that a little bit because I was kind of down and I was like, you know what? I need to be joyful. What does it mean to be Catholic? What does it mean to be Catholic? And so I put a little video out with the help of my two sons and it's called Catholic Cube. I'll put the, the link here and I encourage you to watch it because the answer to what should you do is you should be Catholic. You should be Catholic. And how should I be Catholic? Well, look at the Catholic Cube video. It tells you what to do. It tells you what to do and put your priorities on. Let's do that. Let's be Catholic. Let's be holy. Let's be joyful. And let's pray, pray, pray. Let's be bold. Let's be saints. Thank you for joining me for this video. Uh, please check out our, our website, linktoliturgy.com, where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources. We do have an online school, linktoliturgy.teachable, and we have tons of videos. I mentioned that we're in the 300s uh, uh, videos on the Lexio on the go. Um, I'm getting close, not too close, but close to uh, almost a thousand subscribers. So um, please subscribe to this channel, use the resources here, and thank you for watching. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 